So I'll give you guys both a little introduction. I have two gentlemen from British Columbia joining me here today. Uh, one is, let's call him the king of pandemic time trials. He's run a 359 mile, a 1335, 5,000 meter race. Uh, none of them official, but I have no reason not to believe uh, that those things are true. I think he's in great shape right now. It's John Gay. How are you doing, John? Doing great. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me on the show. A pleasure to see you. It's been a while. And uh, my other guest, also coming from British Columbia, I thought they'd be joining me from the same household, but I think they'll get into that a bit more later. Uh, he is a, well, he's a defending U Sports cross country champion. We got Kieran Lum, a uh, big 3,000 meter race from him. I think it was back in February. Is that February, Kieran? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Right. And then a good break from racing, kind of keeping low for a few months. And then he just made his 10,000 meter debut on the track along with John. So Kieran as well, thanks a lot for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Look guys, uh, I like to start these podcasts by asking people pretty trivially if they are fit, yes or no. But I think you guys answered that question for yourselves <laughs> uh, just a few days ago. You both had a great uh, race at the 10,000 meter um let's see what's this thing called it was the you both had a really good race at the bc endurance project 10,000 meter uh finishing second and third 28 17 for kieran 28 18 for john i believe so no need to answer the question whether or not you're fit we know you're fit but uh tell me a bit about that race yeah i think uh we kind of built it up for a little while going into the fall. Um, it's really nice coming in into this season knowing that we were going to have, uh, I guess, sanctioned meets and that we could actually run times that were going to count. I think, um, yeah, that extra having it actually count on paper is a nice little bit of motivation. And we talked about this, John, I guess maybe since like mid October or early October, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's certainly been kind of the target in our sights as we've plowed through this fall season. Um, that's the first and two race two races that we're going to do. And we're really fortunate to have BC endurance project and coach Richard Lee setting those races up here locally. And I think the understanding was just that there's really no, no opportunity to travel outside of the province without what that entails in terms of quarantining and higher risk of contracting any sort of sickness. And we have enough talent here on the West coast that why not take advantage of the opportunities that are right in front of us and try and set something up locally. And so the 10,000 was really the first part of that. We're doing a 5,000 in just over a week's time at the same track, same group of people. And it's been really gratifying just to finally have an official race to show for what has been now nine months of, as you said, Alex, flying under the radar and just kind of training for some unforeseen goal in the distant future. It's nice to kind of finally have some goals that we can, that we can go after. Mm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The, the 10,000 meter is a, is a fun thing to chase too. And it's a new set of goals for both of you because you're both doing this event for the first time on the track. Um, John, how about you tell me a bit about what that felt like tackling the 25 laps? Yeah, I, uh, I'll be completely honest with you. We actually did a 10,000 unofficially midway through May that kind of kicked off our time trial season. Um, our kicked off. COVID yeah. time trial season. <laughs> and, um, at that point we had just finished up a month of training together at my parents' ski cabin. So we had chosen to quarantine through the period of isolation with, uh, with one another, um, for better or for worse. I like to think mostly for better. <laughs> and we, we used that 10,000 as our first real rust buster and test. And um, it wasn't nearly the result that we got this past weekend, but it certainly helped to overcome that mental hurdle of tackling 25 laps. And I think that really prepared us well going into this one. It didn't seem as daunting as that first time around. And you come to terms with the idea of 
running 2K and then still having 20 laps on the counter um, left to run. So that really helped. And going into it, I think we also did a great job of setting up a, a plan. We were really fortunate to have great pacing from another local guy, Cam Perceviat, and he took us 3K. And then from that point onwards, um, we had a really unique setup where both Kieran and myself were joined by Luke Bruchet, who ended up winning the race in what is the fastest time run on Canadian soil in 19 years, and uh, Charles Philibert Thibodeau. And all four of us made the agreement long before the gun went off that we were going to try and go as far together as possible. And we decided we would trade off 800 meters. And then after each of us had taken 800, we'd trade off 600. And it was kind of like capturing lightning in a bottle where we all just were so set on helping one another out that no matter how tough it was getting for us as individuals, there's that sense of obligation where, gosh, this is tough, but I promised these guys I'd take this next 800 meters, so I better not screw it up. And I better just dig in. And even if I fall apart after my job's done, at least it allows them to get onto the next task and onto the next person leading. And it just really came together beautifully on the night. And it, it, to be honest, the, the laps kind of melted away that way. We just, we were able to find that real flow state that people talk about. And um, it was the shortest 10,000 I've ever run, I guess, both literally in terms of being a personal best, but also uh, mentally, it seems to fly by quicker than our first try time. On Absolutely. The <laughs> yeah. Especially was, um, yeah. Yeah. I think to add to what John said, having that, uh, kind of plan of approaching it I think John mentioned to me like a week or two before the race just like approaching it kind of like a workout where we were just going to trade off leads and uh, click off the 25 laps and yeah it worked out really well to have that kind of mentally broken up into 800 meter segments and uh, not have to think too hard about the race because I think that's for me the big uh, kind of danger with it with a 10 K is overthinking it because you have a lot of time uh, to think about the race in the race itself. So yeah, a whole lot of time to talk yourself out of it. That's for sure. Absolutely. And like you both mentioned, it was, it was quite the field. So it's four, four racers, four finishers, uh, mm -hmm. both of you, Luke Brichet, who took the win and Charles Philibert Boudou from Quebec. So two Olympians and both of you. So it's a, it's a very elite field and, for both of you, like John, you're 25, correct me if I'm wrong? 24, just turned 24 a couple weeks ago. 24, and then Kieran, you're 22? Yep, that's right. Okay, I'm one for two. Kieran, especially for you, like you're lining up in a field with Olympians, you're running your first 10, you ended up running the second fastest Canadian U23 time in history behind only Mohamed, uh, who's obviously gone on to figure out the 10K quite well. Did you surprise yourself? Yeah, I think in some ways I surprised myself. In, I think approaching this race, I knew that I was definitely physically fit and it was going to be about holding it together mentally for the 25 laps. Um, so, yeah, I was it, in some ways it was like a relief to have run that time. And um, especially confidence aspiring in going into shorter races, like if I think this coming 5k will hopefully um, feel a lot shorter than a 10k and kind of knowing that you can stay composed for that long um, is uh, yeah, it's confidence inspiring going forward. And now going forward, we have, it's November now. So we have about six, seven months until the Olympic trials, the 10K trials, which are supposed to happen, I think, sometime beforehand. I don't think that's decided quite yet. But you've both positioned yourselves to be in that conversation of, you know, perhaps representing Canada soon, if not in Tokyo, very soon. Um, going into this year, how do you see your path to the Olympics? John and I, we talked a bit before this conversation about how it's actually complicated to get someone onto the team if they're not, uh, if they don't already have that Olympic standard, Olympic standard being 27, 28, I believe. Uh, very few Canadians in history have gone under that. You guys are still about 45 seconds off, which uh, in a 10K, to be honest, is not all that much, uh, but it's still a significant portion enough. So 
to get to, onto that team could be complicated, but it's possible. How do you both kind of see your path there? Let's start with John. Yeah, well, I think my, uh, my most likely path to the Olympics, I still consider to be through the steeplechase. And while this season has given me a great opportunity to run some off distances, you mentioned running the mile and the 5K this summer and now 10K and another 5K in a week. My hope is really still to continue focusing on the steeplechase. I feel that I've been left with unfinished business in that event after getting my first taste of the world stage about this time last year at the world championships. So if anything, the 10K and the 5K that I'm about to run, I, I'm viewing them really as a, as a launch pad into a steeplechase season. And as Kieran said, running those longer distances and proving to yourself that you can stay composed and stay focused and also to kind of deliver on a goal um, are all really powerful motivators and things that I hope I can apply to the steeplechase. So my hope is to continue training with Kieran through the winter and we'll continue to be doing largely the same sort of workouts. Uh, we're already kicking the tires on the potential for another 10,000 mid-March. And from there, we'll likely start diverging a little bit as our outdoor track seasons draw nearer. And for me, that certainly means focusing in again on the steeplechase. For Kieran, I think he's been blessed with opportunity to uh, go after the 10 or the 5k. Um, so I'm sure I'm very excited to follow his path. But I, uh, yeah, I'm certainly looking looking to the steeplechase and nice to know that my 5000 and my 10,000 are not too far behind. And um, who knows, maybe in future years, those will be those will be an additional challenge. For me. Right. And it's it's hard to walk away from the steeple right now. It'd almost be crazy to it. The steeple's in a weird renaissance in Canada where yeah. you know, a few big dogs have just kind of stepped away. Thinking Alex Janae, Taylor Milne, Matt Hughes is still training. He's uh, definitely the fastest guy in the conversation. With Well, he's the Canadian record holder. But that second spot is kind of up for grabs. And it might be between a few young guys. So between yourself, Jossimo de Gagne, and Ryan Smeaton, I think, ran just yeah. around that 8.30 or just sub-range. Um, mm -hmm. That could be a really interesting battle. Is that count kind of how you see that uh, unfolding? It's a Yeah, absolutely. I think that um, Matt is owed a lot of credit because he's set an incredibly high bar, and he continues to improve EPB at a variety of off distances this year. And he should, so shows no signs of – wanting to relinquish that top spot in the steeplechase. And I'm really grateful for that because it gives us all something to push for. And I think had it been a scenario where it was just the three of us younger guys, there's room for complacency there. If there's three people trying to make a squad of three, um, then there's, there's less motivation to really dig in. But knowing that there's a finite amount of spots and kind of that painful four people trying to fill three spots really lights a fire under all of us. And I think that competition is super healthy. Um, they're both Ryan and JS are great guys. I'm really honored to call them friends and as well as competitors. And I think that we really push each other to, to be better. And um, that's, that really encourages me going into my season, knowing that um like I, I have to be at my very best because those guys are absolutely going to be at their very best. And Karen, for you, is that uh, accurate? You're going to be focusing more on the 5K, 10K going into an Olympic push this year? Yeah, I would say, I would say that's kind of how I have it in my mind. I think probably more the 5K uh, than the 10K. But for me, I think this 10K was a great motivator um, to kind of close some gaps. I think this fall season, that's kind of how I approached it in that it afforded us opportunity to focus on kind of our weaknesses and close those gaps um, going into this coming season. For, for me, I think I struggled last season with, um, yeah, some of that longer aerobic work, uh, like faster tempos and that 10 K work. And I could, have like the 1500 speed and um but kind of matching those and, and coming at it from both sides 
was something that I really wanted to work on. So yeah, I guess tying back to the last conversation, this 10K was nice validation that I've kind of, uh, yeah, closed a lot of that gap. Looking from an, an outsider's perspective, the 10K almost seems like there's a, an extra spot uh, as opposed to the five. So with Mohamed, obviously uh, having the right to take whichever spot he wants, maybe it's one in both races of the way that he had been running all this year. Um, it's kind of the, again, like the steeplechase, it's kind of the race for that second spot. And in the 5K, it looks like Justin Knight has kind of uh, taken a, stra- a stranglehold on that. Oh, spot. absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> uh, whereas in the 10 K that second spot kind of seems up for grabs. There's a lot of 28 low. See, I'm thinking of Ben Flanagan would be, uh, I think he ran a 2806 in the last year, yeah. Rory Linkletter, yourself, uh, John and Luke Brichet, all in the 28 teens. Uh, do you think that's, what's going to happen? Kind of a race for number two. Good question. Um, to be honest, I hadn't put a lot of thought into it um, until, I guess you're you're mentioning it now and and seeing the times that we've run. Um, yeah, for me, in some ways, I try to not think too too hard about these things because people can get injured, people can have huge breakthroughs, other people that we're not even talking about in this conversation can enter into the scene, and I think for me, focusing on it sounds it sounds weird, but focusing on myself and focusing on what I need to do to continue closing those gaps and continue focusing on the process. It's another cliche, but um, is kind of how I approach uh, running. And and I think to add to what you said, these new Olympic standards that were rolled out for this cycle. Um, are really pushing people to step up their game. And we're seeing people run, yeah, incredible times that, um, yeah, were kind of maybe inconceivable in 2015, 2016. Um, So, yeah, I think it's really encouraging for Canadian distance running in general to have these higher standards to strive for. Um, And, yeah, we're we're seeing kind of the fruit of that, in the last six months or well in the last year i think to give people a bit of perspective about these standards i just did a bit of research on both of your events well let's call them the 5k and the 10k before this interview and it seems like in canadian history there's only been three men who have run faster than the current 10k standard being mo ahmed cam levins and simon Baru. And uh, the 5K, there's only two, Mohamed and Justin Knight. So, yeah, these standards are, are very steep for, for someone who's wondering. And I think we can make a comparison across, across events and across genders, too, if we would look into it deeper. Um, before we uh, started this interview, we chatted a little bit, too, about, well, I'd like to ask you what, what life's like, what you both are focusing on. And it seems like um, you're thinking of making that jump into, well, you know, varsity running is pretty much come to an end or coming close to coming to an end. And you're both exploring that professional running avenue, which I think is super interesting because I think it's something that is misunderstood by a lot of people. Um, so tell me a bit about that. You've, you've kind of made the first, uh, you've asked the first questions and uh, tried to figure out how to enter that world. What's that been like so far? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think to preface it, for me, I knew very little about professional running, um, even like six or six or eight months ago. And uh, in the spring, or I guess last winter, uh, John and I were fortunate enough to go stay with Rory Linkletter in Flagstaff for an altitude camp. And I think there, um, yeah, it kind of really opened both of our eyes to what the reality of professional running is like. And it sounds funny, but like I, I didn't even really know what an agent was or um, anything like that. And understanding that an agent is someone that represents athletes uh, and that takes a portion of their salary and gets them into meets and um, hooks them up with more sponsors and helps them promote themselves is, yeah, something I just simply didn't know. And so as the spring progressed, I kind of found myself in a unique situation where as a Canadian athlete, the precedent for running professionally 
um, while there isn't really a, a ton of precedent, there's a handful of athletes um, that have, but it's typically NCAA runners that are kind of, um, it's more the NCAA path, I suppose, um, that the athletes kind of move into professional running from. Mm. Yeah, I could echo that. I, in some ways, I'm a little bit further along, at least in terms of post-collegiate running, whether it could be called professional running or not, I'm not sure. Uh, a little bit further along than Kieran, having graduated myself um, in the spring of 2019. And very much like Kieran, upon exiting university, I had very little understanding of what the world of elite running looked like. And it's interesting, Kieran, that you mentioned that the real precedent for going pro in a kind of traditional sense for Canadians is largely amongst NCAA bound athletes. And I think a large part of that is because they, they go through this collegiate culture where you have um, your entire program set up before you, you know, where you're getting your gear from in university, you know, which meets you're going to your coach is handling the meet entries and the procurement of gear and the travel scheduling. And so it's more of a natural transition where you go from this dependency on the institution that you're at to then filling that void with an agent. And I think the Canadian system for better or for worse, doesn't have that same degree of, I guess, like concierge level service for its athletes. And so upon graduating from the Canadian system, there's maybe a, a naivety about being able to continue doing things on your own. And for me, that certainly existed where I thought, okay, well, I've been able to get my way into the meets that I've needed to get into thus far and make a career for myself as a collegiate running summer club meets outside of the university season. I can probably continue to do that. And I think it was in my first couple of years post-collegiate that I really realized that there is, um, there is a network that's important to plug yourself into. And it really is a who you know world. I think a couple summers of selling my soul in Europe to get into steeplechases where I was trying to run standards by agreeing to pace races a couple of days later or before um, really showed me that it's good to have an ally and it's good to have someone in your corner. And that's where I think an appreciation for what an agent does and what a professional group does um, can really make the difference between kind of hovering in that post-collegiate sub-elite category and really making the jump into the upper echelons of the sport. So it's something I really wish I had known more about. I wish I'd had someone to guide me through that when I was transitioning out of university. Um, and I think that uh, being someone who's still unrepresented by an agent and unsigned by a company I, uh, I would advise anybody coming out of university to really strike while the iron's hot. And I think that that's something Kieran's done a great job of positioning himself to do is um, accumulating a lot of accolades and a lot of success while still in university is the best way to, to make yourself an attractive option for, for an agent or for some sort of representation. And that's something I don't think I did a great job of was capitalizing on the momentum that I had built going out of university because it's one thing to be making senior national teams as a university athlete where it's kind of beyond the expectation of what you should be doing during your college years but once you're no longer in college it becomes the baseline rather than kind of the lofty goal and you just become another face in the crowd very quickly mm. so um yeah that's been my experience and I think <laughs> especially in a year like this where racing opportunities are probably going to be more difficult to come by surrounding yourself with a network of people who can make those connections and be the man in your corner, so to speak is crucial. I keep thinking of uh, the Ben Flanagan example, or when you say, when you talk about the importance of timing and I think of Flanagan having some of his greatest races right around the end of his university career, you know, he won the, the NCAA 10 K uh, and right at the time that he's coming out, his, his stock is really high. 
and therefore he can sign right with Reebok. And that's, you know, that's a very much a stroke of timing. It also seems like um, the way into professional running right now is through all of these prolific United States groups, which seem to be sprouting up everywhere. Like you mentioned, Rory's group, uh, Tin Man Elite, uh, On Running now has a new group. There's so many. Now, coming from both of you who are getting to a place where you, you have the times that are required to get into those groups. You've run the same times as a lot of these professional runners or at least close to equivalent. Um, how easy is it to crack one of these groups? Is it just about times or would they be looking for something else? How does that work? It's a great question. Yeah. I think unfortunately it isn't just about times. Um, that's something I think John, yeah, mentioned this, uh, is that it's, it's also important to run the times in college, uh, itself. And for Canadian athletes, you don't have that same, uh, I guess, opportunity to like win an NCAA title. Um, that's from the agents that I've spoken with and other professional athletes. It's super important, the performance at NCAAs itself to kind of demonstrate that, you are um, that you can race well as well as uh, have good times. And a lot of athletes that are signed to these groups, um, they'll have good times, but not, not necessarily like otherworldly times, uh, but they will have won NCAAs. And, and I think in part that's because the NCAA schedule doesn't necessarily, um, doesn't encourage uh, like super fast times where you can, uh, avoid racing for the six weeks going into a major focus and and on the other hand like that's I, I would say a benefit of the Canadian system or at least for both of us the experience at UBC has been really positive in that sense because our coaches have been very supportive of allowing us to maybe not race some of the smaller meets that the team would typically go to um, in exchange for like just being able to train through that and then focusing on one or two key races in, uh, in hopes of making national teams. So yeah, it's, I would say not only about the times. Um, I think, yeah, social media is, is beginning to play a, a component. And before talking to agents, I kind of had it in my mind that yeah, social media is super important. And one thing that a number of the agents I spoke with, kind of explained to me is that it's it's important but it's truly supplementary um it's not necessarily a replacement um and i think the industry is slowly shifting away from that kind of influencer uh sponsoring influencers because they realize that the conversion rate from an influencer is maybe not as great as having a smaller number of followers that are truly invested in the athlete themselves uh, and not just the brand image. Um, so yeah, there's a number of factors, I think that uh, getting into these groups, um, yeah, there's, I guess there's a number of factors that, that uh, athletes need to kind of consider. Um, maybe I'll, since Kieran mentioned, maybe I'll ask John, uh, sure. what his experience has been about that <laughs> social media master john there we well, go sure, yeah i uh i will probably inevitably end up throwing this back to kieran because he has more experience than i when for a period a period of time went by where he really did believe that that was his ticket to professional <laughs> running glory and you know we had to go through your instagram feed and see every pro's account that he had commented some little hashtag comment on <laughs> But he, uh, yeah, he, the work that he did in delving into that, I think, was valuable for me in curating my own social media presence. And I'm really grateful that the industry is seemingly trending away from putting such an emphasis on that. And I think I also realized over the course of this year that it was less important to me than I thought it was to, um, to have some sort of salient professional signaling, whether that was a gear deal or um, some promo code that people could use with my name in order to get a deal on something online. Um, I, I started really recognizing that that wasn't why I was in the sport in the first place and that 
the work of trying to kind of make my running more about the way it was perceived by the general public or by followers on a social media platform was not the work in my running career that I wanted to focus on. And I think both of us have probably realized that, that yeah, it's great to have that external validation and we all love the dopamine hit of have seeing likes come in on pictures that we post. But at the end of the day, like I don't, I don't go to the track and run a hard race just so that I have a cool picture to post afterwards. And I think that it really was, this season was a reminder that that has to be supplementary, that it, you're not setting yourself up for success if that's your primary objective. And there are people for whom that is their primary objective, but I would argue that you can't serve two masters. And uh, the more energy that you pour into trying to be some public version of yourself is energy directed away from uh, being the best athlete you can be. And I, I'm really in this to be the best athlete I can be and for those opportunities to, to compete against the best. Um, and I think that's something both of us have really recognized. I think there was a time when we were both thinking like, okay, well, in order to be the best athlete we can be, first we need to sh sign a shoe deal. And in order to sign that shoe deal, we've got to get the algorithm right. And um really grow our platform because that's what that's what sponsors are looking for that's what agents are looking for but i think in both of our experience talking with agents they're they're still first and foremost athlete representatives not influencer representatives and so yeah. they, they do prioritize the athletics which is really heartening because i think that's what got us into the sport in the first place was a love of the sport itself yeah, I agree. I uh, definitely agree with what John said. I think um, having it as kind of ancillary to running itself is an important distinction. And I think it depends on kind of where you are. Um, for me, for example, like this, this semester has been a real challenge uh, with school and, and stress just in general of life. And I quickly realized that like my energy was not best spent um, curating content. And um, I think my kind of opinions right now are, are reflective of where I am uh, with running and, and with life. But I think in the same way that if you've got a ton on your plate um, with school, maybe you don't do like the tiny extra little drills and some things kind of need to need to go uh, while you focus on what's truly important. Um, and in the same way, yeah, maybe my opinions will shift and, and I'll learn more things from uh, groups or agents that say like, actually, no, it is, it's important, you know, now that you're part of this group to continue to uh, generate content for our brand. And maybe that's part of your contract, um, which I don't know right now because I just, I haven't been exposed to that, but I think it's important to figure out where social media fits into um kind of, I guess, like, yeah, your uh, athletic career. Um, I think, yeah, seeing a lot of the pros um, and their constant generation of social media content, it strikes me as like, wow, that's a lot of work. That's um, that's a significant portion of their day. And, and obviously they have time and, and that's um, important to them or it's uh, necessary or deemed necessary. Uh, but right now, I think for me, I'm just trying to focus on running faster times. That's, uh, I think these, um, I think these perspectives coming from both of you are very valuable because I think a lot of people who are trying to enter the pro ranks or maybe younger athletes who just have pro aspirations, you know, Kieran, like you say, we'll see these professional runners produce so much content, especially these tr groups in the States right now. Like Tin Man Elite has such a prolific uh, YouTube channel and, and a bunch of social media. And it's the same for NAZ Elite. And mm -hmm. you start wondering if both of those things have to come together. If you have to be generating so much content to maintain a contract and that you see a lot of people and you know, people in your community who are 
perhaps not all that fast runners, but who are ambassadors because they're very plugged in to the running community. And you think maybe that's what someone needs to, uh, maybe that's what someone needs to get a contract. So I think a lot of people wonder it. And then compound that with the boredom of the pandemic and you'll just see a lot of people gravitating naturally more to Instagram. And I think that's a very natural thing. Um, one thing I uh, wanted to ask you both about when one of you mentioned it earlier was how both of you dealt with the pandemic. So you both, what did you say? You both quarantined in a cottage together. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll call it a cabin since we're on the <laughs> on West the, Coast. On the West Coast, cabin. we call them cabins. <laughs> on the yes, East Coast, you call them you cottages. Call right. them. Yes. <laughs> um, so things started really tightening up here in British Columbia, I suppose much like the rest of the country, towards the end of March. Um, high school spring break was kind of the beginning of the lockdown here. And uh, very quickly, we both came to the realization that the lockdown in a big city with tons of people around was going to be distinctly challenging in terms of training together and um, lifting and just trying to go through all of the things that we had become so accustomed to doing and that I think were really vital to continue charting a path in the right direction with our training and with our progress. Uh, all the tracks in Vancouver, not that there's very many to begin with, were shut down to the public, which was problematic. And there was just a real, um, a real sense of anxiety and kind of a, of this stifling effect of mistrust everybody at that point didn't know anything about this pandemic about this virus and so there is a sense that anybody could be could be dangerously your next door neighbor suddenly becomes a threat because who knows if they have the have it and what it'll do if you contract it and i think that we were both fortunate to have an outlet uh, by virtue of being able to get out of the city and the remainder of the province was doing a lot better at that time than here in the lower mainland and um, I'm really fortunate to have a family ski cabin at a, a local mountain near Kelowna where I grew up and the ski hill had been shut down for the remainder of the year due to the pandemic which presented a really cool opportunity to co-opt my parents cabin and turn it into our home base for an altitude camp it sits at just above 5700 feet um, of altitude, which is very comparable to say Boulder, Colorado, or uh, Sam Moritz in Switzerland. And we had planned on doing an altitude camp in Flagstaff in April prior to our outdoor track season. And we kind of had in our minds that a camp together would, would be a good use of our time. And so we got creative and found a way to make that camp happen closer to home. Uh, so along with my very patient and understanding fiance, uh, the th Kieran and I and Camille, my fiance, uh, set up shop at Big White for four whole weeks. We were there from April 1st till April 30th, and we had the mountain pretty well to ourselves. We were there as the snow melted and the spring started and put in just a really solid month of, of work quarantining together with, with them and with my uh, immediate family in Kelowna and just going to work, which was a really unique experience, certainly. And uh, yeah, I'd be curious to hear Kieran's thoughts on it. Not that I haven't heard some of them before, but he was kind of, he became the adopted son of uh, the gay family in Kelowna for a month. <laughs> Would you agree that you were the son, Kieran? <laughs> I guess so. Yeah. I, um, yeah, it was, it was a really fun month. It was probably one of the more, more fun months uh, that I've had ever. Um, just, yeah, great company and um, being able to get away from the pandemic, you know, like I think there was definitely days that we just, we didn't talk about COVID or we didn't really think about it because it, it didn't affect us and it was just business as usual. And I think I, I didn't fully appreciate how helpful that was until like months later when I had basically experienced one less month of COVID than everyone else. And um, yeah, I would, I would say the training was very difficult for me. Um, Big white is maybe not the, it's not flag stuff for running. Um, 
we were running essentially up and down people's driveways uh, in the snow for the first two weeks. And that was my undoing um, physically. Uh, I pulled a hamstring after a couple weeks. And so there's a, a bit of a damper on that. But nonetheless, I think we kind of made the most of it. And just, yeah, it was a fun month. Um, it was also fun exploring BC's logging roads um, and just finding more places to run that you maybe wouldn't expect um, that were more flat than the, the driveways that we were running up and down for the first couple of weeks. Um, so yeah, it was a overall really fun experience. Coming from someone who uh, follows both of your social medias, it was, it was so refreshing just to see these positive posts in March and April, everything was so gloomy and no one was seeing each other. And it seemed like everyone was in their own place and doing then, push up challenges. Yeah. Then you guys are doing push up challenges and you're wearing these glasses and training together and you look like Daft Punk on the track. And it, it was just a really refreshing for, for, for people. I think it's, it's for you guys are fortunate to be able to, to do that because uh, like you say, Karen, I think it, for you, it probably delayed that, long slow burn of of uncertainty and weirdness um absolutely what, are, what about now we're in november what's going on in the lives of of john and kieran away from running kieran if if uh memory serves correctly you're still in school you're is it chemical engineering yeah i'm still in school i'm in electrical engineering electrical. um yeah to be completely transparent this semester has been probably the most challenging that i've had in in the last four or five years. Um, yeah, I guess I'm strugg like struggling with school. And I think you alluded, it, alluded to it earlier with that slow burn of COVID. I think it's in the last month, it's really um, kind of surfaced in me how challenging I'm finding it um, from a mental health standpoint, uh, not having that so like that same social support network around me. Um, I'm super grateful and I feel very fortunate to have a team around me that I can still meet in person and talk to and just kind of, just kind of normalize things. I think I really undervalued how much I depended on just tiny social interactions throughout the day. And it's starting to, it's starting to surface. And so yeah, I guess having struggled this semester quite a bit, it was really nice with that 10K to validate some hard work and know that I can still race well um, when I'm struggling. But um, yeah, I, this semester is like the, the last hopefully challenging one. Uh, and then I scheduled my year so that uh, next semester is significantly lighter and um, can direct a bit more energy into the running and recovering and and that's something that i'm increasingly aware of is that yeah running is one thing but it's it is really about what you do outside of the time that you're running as well and sleeping nine hours a night and napping and doing the little drills and focusing on mental performance as well is something that i've um yeah really done this semester and i think it's helped me through probably more things outside of running than running itself, but also running. And uh, like I, I guess, yeah, having a bit more time to, to relax and um, do things outside of just school because this past month has been almost exclusively school. And I, Evan, you've been, if, if you're listening to that, you'll be surprised to hear that. But yes, I'm suffering with school right now. <laughs> I have Evan uh, coming on to the podcast tomorrow. We'll see how he's doing. <laughs> I think he's laying he's laying low, except for his uh, except for his prolific Twitter account, which will remain unnamed <laughs> tomorrow, I suppose. Uh, yo, no, I get that. You know, Karen, my um, I'm also still in school, and everything's online. And some days it's fine, some days it flows, and some other days you just it's just so hard to muster up any creativity or any any normal work ethic. And I guess that's kind of just a that's the it's inherent to, to what's going on right now. Yeah, absolutely. I think one thing I'm, I'm finding helps a lot is setting boundaries in the day. Um, a teammate of mine was talking about kind of approaching running with, or sorry, approaching school with the same intensity as running. And 
scheduling basically work intervals. And so the idea is that you, you work for like an hour or, or so, and then you make sure that during that hour it's quality. And then you also take a break and a set break kind of thing. And, and having hard stops and saying like, no matter what, no matter how stressed I'm going to be in a day, I'm not going to work past 10 PM or 10 30, whatever it is. And stopping for the point of failure in the same way that you don't run yourself into the ground every workout uh, so that you can approach the next day and still have some energy. That's a, that's a really good insight because I find that that would fight against the thing that I struggle with the most. That's doing a few things at the same time, like tricking myself into thinking, oh, I put four good hours of work in, but those four hours are in fact me kind of working. My phone is there. I have two or three tabs open and it ends up being, you know, a long time for a low quality of work. Whereas Absolutely. if I could change that and just put in boom, one good hour of work, you save time, you feel, well, you, you produce better work and you probably feel better about yourself at the end. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Easier said than done, but yeah. <laughs> Very much so. Yes. Yeah. And John, what about yourself? So you're, you're finished school. You're into the world yeah, of work. I, uh, I'm a free bird relative to you two students, I suppose. Um, I, it's not lost on me that school stress is a very unique type of stress. And I think that having trained with Kieran virtually every single day this semester, it, uh, I gained a new, a growing appreciation for just what a weight it is to be in school. Uh, that said, I, I'm working myself, but I'm fortunate to work from home. Um, and I work for a track club, which is great because they're incredibly understanding of my my needs and my demands as a track athlete. Um, so this has been a really, a really good season for me, um, this COVID season, in that it's, it's been an opportunity to, to enjoy being at home and to enjoy being in a routine that I've created for myself rather than having a routine imposed on me by uh, schoolwork. And so I, uh, I suppose in some ways it's a contrast from what Kieran's going through where I found, I feel that I've found a really good balance and I'm really grateful for that and feel very blessed that I have enough security through support from athletics Canada and through my, uh, through my role in the track club that I manage to be able to devote a lot of my energy to training and to being the best athlete I can be. Another thing that I think I've tried to embrace is this chance to really be at home and be in one place for an extended period of time. Um, over the course of 2019, there was a, about a four month stretch where I spent more time away from the city and away from my fiance than, than in the city with her. And it's been really nice to reset that and in some ways bank a lot of time this year for what will inevitably be um, a very busy near year next year, Hope, hopefully. Uh, provided that things do in, in fact improve and there is a track season to look forward to. Um, so I think recognizing that next year will be a lot of time away and a lot of mental energy being poured into what is the new Olympic year, I've really been able to enjoy this season of having less of that urgency in what I do and being able to settle into a routine and just enjoy sleeping in my own bed every night and having less busy of a schedule. Yeah, it, I know it's probably just kind of <laughs> taunting Kieran right now and may probably you as well. With, oh, I <laughs> don't have that burden of school. That's a nice thought. Um, yeah. Yeah. Although I think uh, you're being, you're being a bit humble with yourself, John, because with any extra time you have, you're undertaking some cool projects. Uh, just recently you posted on social media that you're, you're uh, starting something quite cool. You're aiming to raise money. You're aiming to raise a few thousand dollars, $25,000 for is it young people in Northern India so that yeah. they can afford post-secondary education, which is awesome. So it's through a charity called child of mine. Yeah. Uh, do I have that right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, uh, child of mine is an organization that my family has been involved with for well over a decade now and i've been very blessed and fortunate to have had the opportunity to travel with um, my father to northern india he's been the director of this 
organization for 10 years. He's stepped down from that role now, but in his final year in the role last fall, I was able to join him um, in visiting these homes. And I, I had been there 11 years earlier and made connections and friendships with many of the children my own age there. And we've in some ways grown up together on other sides of the world. And I think returning at an age where I had recently graduated university and seeing them now also recent graduates of university was really powerful. And it showed just, uh, I guess, a, a shared experience despite so many differences um, in terms of culture and location. Uh, they were still able to, to have a lot of the same opportunities that I've been given. And uh, the, the homes that this fundraiser supports are really committed to raising children who come often from destitute poverty um, and giving them the sense of family and a sense of belonging at these homes and also giving them a platform so that they can shoot for whatever their ambitions may be. And for many of them, that's post-secondary education, which uh, doesn't come cheap. And there's a commitment that just like a parent would want to provide the best opportunities for their kids. These homes really want to provide the best opportunities and not simply wash their hands of these children once they reach the age of majority, but rather commit to them as, as their own children and see them through their post-secondary education and see them grow into careers and into the future leaders in their cities and towns and in their country. And that's something that was really powerful um, to me, seeing the fruits of that work 11 years after my first visit. And it's something that I feel very strongly about. Uh, Post-secondary education has impacted my own life so powerfully. And I've seen firsthand how it's impacted the lives of these young adults who uh, grew up kind of in congruence with me on the other side of the world. And it's, uh, it's something that I've been given this platform through running to, to, to raise awareness for. And I feel very, very grateful for that opportunity. And I think I'd be remiss not to leverage what platform I do have um, to try and make a difference, however, however small that might be. That's an awesome initiative and it's on your social media. So if there's any listeners out there who are interested, they can check out your Instagram. And I think you have that link up on there in your yeah, bio. So it's right? all in my bio. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, and you have until December 3rd, you mentioned. December 3rd is out, our so. uh, fundraising deadline. Yeah. So we'd love to see some more donations uh, come in between now and then. Awesome. And uh, gentlemen, I won't keep you too much longer. It's almost lunchtime. Uh, in BC, if my math is right. Oh, no, it's only 11.06. But either way, I will keep you that much longer. Before you go, I'll give you uh, both uh, one chance to give a shout out to anyone you think might be listening or anyone you hope is listening. It can be anyone. We'll start with Kieran. Who's your shout out to today? Probably Evan Yubin. That's the one person I know definitely will be listening. <laughs> and I guess you said he'll be on the podcast tomorrow. So... That's, uh, a, that's, that's a, good a tough test. question to be sprung on, but <laughs> well, we'll send a shout out to Evan Ubeen and hopefully he reciprocates tomorrow. And John, up to you. Uh, if we're going off of the, um, the train of thought of people that we are confident will listen to this podcast, the one I can guarantee is my father. He seems to follow my career more closely than I do. So hi, dad. Thanks for listening in. Um, I know you're a busy man, so I appreciate that you took 60 minutes out of your day to hear us talk and I love you. <laughs> so sweet. And please tell us, tell them to follow us on Instagram. We could use the follower. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you so much, Alex, for uh, having us yeah, on. No really question. enjoyed uh, chatting with you. Just, just a nice conversation. Oh, well, yeah. uh, it's me who uh, thanks both of you. It's really nice to catch up and uh, I hope that listeners enjoy the conversation. Really good insight. Uh, from both of you and hopefully the training and life and everything keeps going well in BC and that you both have a happy holiday. Yeah. Thank like you. Well, all the best with your uh, pending quarantine in a couple of weeks time. Um, hopefully you can make the most of it. Yes. We greased up the treadmill in the basement, so it should be all right. <laughs> oh, you're ready. Uh, well, the thank treadmill. you so much. It's, uh, it's always such a pleasure to have this platform and great to chat with you as well. <laughs>